All right, so recap of this series. Um, let's talk about it, the relevancy of, the, of uh, seven keys, the relevancy of the Christian walk. We outlined several different keys every week, and we kept them same. We kept the same points every week so that we can follow it much easier, all right? So the first week, uh, we talked about the fear of the Lord and how in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We decided that anything outside of God's wisdom isn't true wisdom, at all. Uh, our next point was loving God, loving people. And so we see the repeated thing that God puts, that everything starts with him, that we cannot properly love people if we don't properly love God. Next, we looked at the Holy Spirit being our helper. We know that it is by the Holy Spirit that we um, not able, not just able to live this life, but it's a guarantee of our eternal life that we're going to see one day. Uh, we talked about time. We talked about how it's not guaranteed how um, we use the phrase God, God willing because we know that it is only by his will. We see that his word talks continuously about teaching us to number our days, give us an accurate understanding and an accurate view of the amount of time that you have given us. Uh, we talked about the intimacy of our creator, how he knows our name, how he knows us better than we know ourselves. And we saw in the opening song today, um, the singer started out by saying that you've been better to me than I've been to myself. And so that is that is uh, very, very true. Uh, we've looked at God's instructional manual. We affectionately entitled it that because we know that it is our guide. The same way that we have earthly instructional manuals for everyday objects that we use, like bookshelves and tables and a bunch of other things that we don't like to put together. Um, we still have that same thing with God's word. And then we took a last look at hope about a uh, future look, which is what the Feast of Tabernacles represents a future look into God's kingdom where the very nature of animals will be changed and transformed into a time that right now we can't really fathom that. I was leaving out of, uh, I stopped to get a quick trip last week uh, when we left out of here. It was like after nine, it was dark. And I saw some police officers, there were security guards, they were right outside and they were talking about, man, I got to do this, I got to do that. And I walked by them and I said, man, I said, one day we're not going to need you guys like that. Oh, no, no. And I, what I, I had to explain it, what I had to explain to him was, we appreciate your service now, but the point I'm trying to make is, there, there's not going to be a need for security. People are going to do right on their own, yeah. and so that's what I was, uh, that's what I was explaining to him. He was like, "Oh, okay, I'll be okay." Yeah, it took it took a little more elaboration. <laughs> yeah, listen, hey, my brother in law, he get another uh, another case, but yeah, we, <laughs> you know, I didn't, it didn't, I didn't dollar me to after I said it, you know, what I mean, because I was like, "Oh yeah, probably did, probably did sound right." <laughs> um, so turn with the Malachi. Chapter one. And when you get there, say he's just getting started. Malachi. Chapter one. We said that the Christian walk is relevant to, to all people in all places and in all seasons. We're looking at the fear of the Lord. We, be, we believe that, that this is not an exhaustive list of all of the different keys that go along in the Christian walk, but these are some of the ones that we've chosen to highlight the last couple of weeks that we believe can benefit us right away. And the first one is the fear of the Lord. Malachi chapter one and verse six, it says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? What verse? Chapter, six, uh, chapter one, verse six. Malachi, Malachi. Chapter one. That's right. I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you for doing it. Malachi chapter one, verse six. It says a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priest who despise my name. And so at this point in time, what God is trying to point out is that there were individuals who were charged with different tasks. And we talked last week on the Day of Atonement about how the priests were uh, the middleman between God and us. And so there were time periods throughout the history of Israel where people were not doing right on their own. And so God is highlighting, he's saying, 
Where is my respect? There's a popular phrase that's been going on the last couple of years that says, put some speck on my name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what God is saying is, you all show respect and honor to those who are in a far less inferior position than I am. You give them respect. Why don't I get that same respect? A lot of the songs that we sing week after week, we talk about who God is. We talk about how great he is. And then sometimes our actions, including myself, will show the opposite. That fear of the Lord, the first key that we believe in the step. We have to understand who he is and give him what he deserves. Turn over to two chapters and to the, the third chapter, same book, Malachi. Malachi chapter three. And in verse 16, a book of remembrance, it says, then those who fear the Lord, fear the Lord. We say the fear of the Lord is not we are afraid of him or that he's some far off being waiting to strike us and zap us when we do wrong. That's not what we mean. When the Bible says fear the Lord, it's talking about having an awe and a reverence. It says those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves. Them. Right here, that is, that is super special. God is saying that he, they're going to be mine. We're going to be claimed by our creator when we have him in the right pedestal. We used to sing a song growing up a lot of time. It was, uh, it was called, we place you on the highest place. When he's, in, when he's in the right spot, there are benefits that come along with that. We cannot have the right Christian walk if someone else is sitting in his seat. What type of relationship, any type of relationship, will work without respect? What type of relationship will work if you see the other individual as something other than what they actually are? Yes, that's my wife, but I treat her like, that's my husband, but I treat him like, oh, those are my students, but I treat them less than, right? Every type of relationship, every type of relationship has to see the other side as it actually is. That's why when God says, they are my precious jewels, they mean something. Repeatedly throughout scripture, it says that, that, that uh, the followers and his believers, the apple of his eye. We are his royal people, chosen people, because he sees us for what we really are. He sees us as his children that are far, far of great value. Next, turn with me to Romans, the 13th chapter. Romans chapter 13. The next that we look at is we're seeing loving God and loving people. Romans chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 8. It says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. That's what we love to tell the IRS, right? We love to tell all our bill collectors. God said, I only owe you love. I told somebody, I was like, hey, yeah, I'm going to give you that on a later date. I wanted to be like, Romans chapter 13. He says, oh, no one except anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this, namely saying you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. I was, I was looking at the story this past week. 
Um, just about, you know, different random acts of kindness that we see. And there was one lady who was having a really tough time. She had just lost her husband. And so a lot of times she was, she was in the house and she was just, you know, she didn't really have, you know, the emotional strength to, to leave the house. And so she, she worked up the strength one day and she said, I'm going down the street. I'm going to uh, Dunkin' Donuts. And so as she's in the Dunkin' Donuts line, she's in the drive through and she just burst out into tears. She just started crying because she hadn't been that far emotionally or physically in a while. And so as she got closer and closer to the window, you know, usually drive through um, those those uh, service areas usually work by younger people. And so um, one of the people who were working there, they saw that she was in need. And so what she ordered, they put a note on top of her cup. It says, we, we, we love you. We don't know what you've been through, but we love you. And that made her day. That's great. That's an example of loving God, loving people, showing that genuine love. Because there's always going to be differences. We were talking about that last week a couple of times. And, and um, it reminds me that we're all, I even had a conversation this morning about people. And I was getting ready to leave, coming here. But I was like, you know what? This might be a moment to let let my light shine. And so I was talking to uh, uh, my barber, and he was like, "Yeah, this 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 you know particular group of people they just they're like this, and they're they're like that, and they're always doing this and always doing that." And I was like, "Well, hold on, hold on. I understand the pain that you're communicating, but those people are made in the image of God. We don't like their actions." We don't always like what they do, but they're made in the image of God the same way that we are. So it doesn't mean that we totally disregard what has transpired, especially to our group, our community, but we are called to love them. Turn to Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10, we're going to pick up in verse 9, Acts chapter 10, verse 9, it says, The next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have not eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen, behold, the men had been sent from Cornelius and made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had, had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man who fears God and has good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear the words from you. Let's go down to verse 24. It says, in the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was awaiting for them and had, had, and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with one with or go to another nation but god has shown me that i should not call any 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 man common or unclean right one of the challenges that was faced in the new testament when the gospel was being spread was that 
Gentiles, people outside of God's chosen race were viewed a certain way. And so when they were viewed a certain way, that caused them to not receive the proper love that they should have been given. We see later that God's word says that he so loved the world, loves all people. Doesn't matter where you come from. Sometimes people are corrected in dramatic fashion in the way Peter was, but sometimes it's done different. Sometimes it might be a conversation with someone that you, that you didn't expect to have on your way out of the door. Loving people. It always boggles my mind how, how certain groups feel like they have uh, their place in the front of the line. They're elbowing people to get to the front of the line because they're a certain skin color. No, oh, God loves me more. No. It's a trick of the, that's a trick of the enemy. It's a barrier that has been placed in the way to trip up people and to take their focus off of what it should be on. Boggles my mind how certain church groups can be divided and split. The word says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Loving God, loving people. We're not going to always see things the same way. And I don't think it gets any closer than twin brothers. We came in the same way. He was pulling my feet the same way that <laughs> it was going on in the Bible. But even we don't see things the same way all the time. So it's not about always agreeing and seeing things. It's about loving those people. And so I was having a conversation. Amen. I was, yeah, amen. I was having a conversation with another individual. He was a couple of years ago. Um, I was taking an Uber ride home. And, you know, his name was David too. But he was Caucasian. And so as we were going home on the radio, he, he, he kept making statements like, man, I don't understand why they're doing this. We were talking about the protest. You know, that time, I think Daniel were down there in the streets protesting too. And he was like, I just don't understand why they're doing this. You know how sometimes people can say things and he's like, okay, I'll let it go. And then they keep going. So I was like, okay, you know, okay, I think you want me to respond. I'm gonna, so I'm okay. So I said, I'm going to do this, brother. I said, we got the same name, man. So I'm going to take that as a sign as the Lord want me to speak to you. I said, before we have this conversation, we can agree to disagree. But I said, I'm going to enlighten you to what and why things are going on. Because it might not be in your world. He was ex-military. He was a school teacher. And I told him, I said, I'm a school teacher as well. I'm not ex-military. I said, the reason why people are marching in the streets, I said, because what's going on right now, and it was right after George Floyd had just got murdered. And I said, the reason why people are, are, what, are marching right now and standing up for it, because it's an unjust act. I don't care what color his skin is. I said, I believe in a God that is a God of justice. I said, he's caused us to love all people. I said, I don't matter what color you are. I said, and what you're feeling right now is a ripple effect of what's going on around the world. I saw a clip on social media. At that time, right after that murder, people in Paris, Germany, and I'm not talking about small crowds. I'm talking about humongous crowds. What was everybody recognizing? They were recognizing what was happening was wrong. They didn't speak the same language. They didn't have to. They knew that that man's life was stolen from him in front of the world. That does not please God. And so I told him, I said, furthermore, I said, man, what you should do is, I said, rather than condemning another person's action because you don't understand it, I said, you should seek to understand it and engage it. I said, I'm telling you this because somebody else might not explain it to you the same way I am. I said, just because it's not in your world doesn't mean that it's not legitimate. I said, cat calling, right? When women walk by and men make certain remarks, and I said, that's not in my world. But if my woman was explaining that to me, guess what? I would seek to understand. It's not about always understanding. It's not, all, you know what? I don't get it. I don't know where you come from, but help me understand. That's an act of loving people. Loving God, loving people. And so we cannot do that right if we don't love God first. Amen. Amen. Next, we're looking at our helper, the Holy Spirit. 
I, I thought about it and I was like, man, you know what? How many amazing feats have been accomplished by God's spirit? Turn me to Judges chapter 15. And through this time period, Israel didn't have a certain leader. And so God raised up a certain man. Judges chapter 15, verse 16. All right, so let's start in verse 14. It says, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Philistines, that was um, the Israelites' arch enemy. Like the Lakers and Celtics, Red Sox and Yankees, the Falcons and the Saints. <laughs> which, by the way, we went to that game a few weeks ago. All right, all right. <laughs> and as we were leaving out of there, I said, Lord, I need your strength. Because those Saints fans were unruly. But Judges chapter 50 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire and his bonds. And his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, and took it and killed a thousand men with it. We cannot have the spirit walk, a spirit-filled Christian walk without God's spirit. If we could do amazing things without his spirit, then he wouldn't have to give us his spirit. If Samson could have gotten out of that situation by himself, then God wouldn't have given him the Holy Spirit. True. We need the Holy Spirit during our Christian walk so that we can do those things that we can't do in our own power. Every day, every week, What's the song we used to sing back in the day? I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. We need God's spirit on this Christian walk. Because if we try to do it in our own power, we will see failure. Turn me to Zechariah chapter 4. And in Zechariah chapter 4, in verse 6, it says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What is he communicating through the prophet Zechariah? He's like, you can't do this on your own. You can't. You need my spirit. What did Christ communicate to his disciples before his death? He said, it's better that I go away from you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm giving you a helper. A helper helps. Helps you do what? Your everyday life. Romans chapter six. And in the sixth chapter of Romans, we're going to go down to verse 10. It says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive in Christ. So he's saying that the spirit of God is what is going to accompany us on our walk. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal, body, mortal bodies that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but, prevent your, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members of instruments of righteousness to God. Those are pretty powerful words. He's saying, this is what you're going to be. You're going to be an instrument used by God. He says, you're being made alive. How are we made alive? Through his spirit. It's the difference maker. It's the thing that sets us apart. I think Brother Glenn was sharing a story a few weeks ago, and he, and he was in the situation, and they said, though, he said, everybody is not among us. Everybody here is not on our team, basically. 
It's a different spirit. God's spirit that must accompany us on our walk is absolutely relevant. It's not an option. Next, we have time. And so far in this series, we talked about how we've, uh, how um, in Psalms chapter 90, I remember this was a, this was a scripture that my granddad used to uh, say all the time. And he echoed this and he would say from everlasting to everlasting. It actually reminds me of, of my, my granddad and my, gra my grandma, my dad's parents, uh, because right after my grandma passed, I remember my dad reading this scripture and he was telling us to teach us to number our days. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, 80, 80, you know, 85, 90 years, that's a long time. Turn me to First Chronicles, chapter 12. So King David was transitioning to take over as king of Israel. And so it says, David's army at Hebron. Now these were the numbers of divisions that were equipped for war and came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him, according to the word of the Lord. I'm sorry, what verse? First Chronicles chapter 12. And we're going to start, uh, that was verse 23. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 23. Now, these were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for war and came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him. And so what was happening here and, and right before this passage too, David had, uh, he made a pact with the people that he was going to be in charge of governing. And so they're like, hey, basically, hey, we believe in you. We know you're the next king and we're going to do our part to help you walk into what God has ordained for you. Down at verse 32, it says, of the sons of Issachar, and so they named all these different people groups, right? But what stood out to me is verse 32. He says, of the sons of Issachar, who had an understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. There was a distinction made from this group of people as opposed to the other people who were all helping David walk into what God ordained for him. They understood the time. They understood what their purpose was a little bit differently than the others who were helping David take over. Having a proper understanding of the times allowed and helped to bring about God's will. We have to understand the time. We know that tomorrow isn't promised. Life is a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Romans chapter 13. We're just over there. Romans in the 13th chapter. Verse 11, he says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for our salvation. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The key to our Christian walk is knowing the time. In the sport of basketball, if you have a good point guard, one of the attributes that makes him a good point guard is that he knows how much time is on the clock. He, he does his job based off of how much time is on the clock. So if there's a short amount of time, then he'll run a play that only takes a short amount of time. But if there's more time, he will orchestrate events on the, to the court that fits with how much time is left. He understands how much time we have. What he's communicating is that believers are pictured to be sleep or inactive. And salvation here, referring to the future when believers will be saved 
from the presence of sin. Night is depicted as the present, the present time. And day is always depicting Christ's return. So he's like, understand what time it is. Know what time it is. Do we think enough of our creator to ask the question, are we using it wisely? That's one of the challenges that all Americans and the people around the world are faced with week after week after week. They call it the rat race. Man, what's the first reasons people usually give when they can't do something? I ain't have time. Man, I didn't have time. If I only know. We looked last week at, at the, uh, the rich wine man, how his life was called upon him. He had stored up all of these riches. He had did all of this stuff. He put, his, he put his ladder on the wall just to realize that he put it in the wrong place. Time. Are we making the most of it daily? I know one of the things that helps out a lot is the Bible app. Bible app, it's easy. You know, pretty much everybody has a phone. You can click on it. They have, you know, things set up. You can get your word in. Daily. They also even have really, really good prayers on there now. The last couple of years, they weren't like that. But now... Or at least I didn't see it, I'll say that. But um, recently, a lot of the prayers um, that I see on there are, are just super beneficial. So which app do you use? I do uh, the Bible app, U version. Bible app, U version. U version, yep. If you look at if you go to any Google store, the app store, you, uh, you download it, it'll give you the option. And so I was saying that that's a tool to help us use our time properly, distractions, which is another tool the enemy uses. Distractions, distractions, distractions. We have to make sure that we have an understanding of the times like the sons of Issachar. Bible doesn't mention too much more about them, but it does say that they knew their assignment when it came to that. Paul is saying, hey, we only have so much time left in the game. Let's use our time wisely. Turn with me to Psalms 147. And probably my favorite of all the points is the intimacy that we have with our creator. Psalms. Chapter 147, go to verse 3. Psalms 147, verse 3. It says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the star, he counts the number of the stars and he calls them all by name. We went to a camp this past summer. We we're out, and I don't know if it's just because we were in South Georgia where there's less lights. But at nighttime, I was like, man, I can see this, the stars out here a lot more clear than I can back in Atlanta. It says he calls the stars by name. He has a name for every one of them. That's intimacy. If I had a classroom full of students and I only knew half of their names, they wouldn't think I cared about them that much. They'd be like, one of the first things they say is like, you don't even, you don't even know my name. So can't care that much. But if this is what God does with his creation, how much more us? Matthew chapter six and verse 26. Matthew chapter six. Verse 26 says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. He's like, look at God's creation. They don't even do anything to earn God's goodness. And he still takes care of them. Ask a parent of any newborn. The baby doesn't do anything all day long. Eats, sleeps, uses the bathroom, and repeats that same cycle over and over. 
You wouldn't ask that parent, why you love that baby? That baby don't do nothing. He don't pay the bills. He don't go to work. He don't do X, Y, and Z. God is saying, I love something that's far less valuable than you. And I take care of that. How much more are you? It says, are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. He's saying it again. He's like, the grass. Grass isn't doing anything. It just is. He says, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? He's like, man, he, God takes care of the smallest parts of our creation. He's like, grass? We cut, we cut grass. I was thinking about that when we, when we came back from uh, the, the, the camp. And we had a lot of work cut out for us outside. It's like cutting the whole grass, and I had the privilege of doing it. And so I'm lifting up the the, the lawnmower, and I'm cutting all the grass. And I'm and I just thinking about this. I'm like, wow, like care about this grass. I'm like, it's true. It's getting cut today. It was here today. It's gonna be gone tomorrow. But we're gonna be here always. So how much more? How much more than that? That shows an intimate level. You think about when people give people gifts. And one of the first thing they say is, uh, you put some thought into this. What makes it special? The fact that they care. The fact that they thought enough to put a detail in whatever the gift is to show you what? That they care. That's intimacy. So God is saying, I, I do that with grass. Even the smallest detail of my creation, I take care of. And you're far greater than that. He's intimate with his creation. Turn me to Jeremiah chapter 36. And when you get there, say, He's almost done, but not quite. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 36. Almost done. <laughs> We're going to start in verse one. <laughs> almost done, but not quite. Jeremiah chapter 36, starting in verse one, it says, It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the, from the Lord saying, take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations. From the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah, even to, his, to this day, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversaries which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way that I might forgive their iniquity and their sin, right? Because like really what it boils down to is like, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, God wants us to turn from that. Then Jeremiah called Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote on a scroll of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord, which he had been spoken to him. Verse six, it says, you go therefore and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction, the words of the Lord and the hearing of the people in the Lord's house on the day of the fast. Go down to verse 11. It says, when Micaiah, the son of Jemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the book, he then went down to the king's house and to the scribe's chamber, and there all the princes were sitting. There's a list of their names. I'm not even going to trip over their names, right? So we're going to go down to verse 13. <laughs> and then it says, I know my limit. It says, then Micaiah declared to them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the book in the hearing of the people. So God gave Jeremiah a word. 
Jeremiah told Barak to write it down and Barak took it to another person. So there's a middleman between them. So you have the words straight from the Lord written down on a scroll. Then it says down in verse 15, it says, and they said to him, sit down now and read it in our hearing. So Barak read it in their hearing. Now it happened when they heard all the words that they looked in fear for one another, for, from one to another, and said to Barat, we will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Barat, saying, tell us now, how did you write all these words at his instruction? Let's talk about this being his instruction manual. So Barat answered them. He proclaimed with his mouth all these words to me, and I wrote them with ink in the book. He's like, simple. He told me, and I wrote it down. Like he thought it was going to be something else. He just, he just told me. And I wrote it down. Verse 20. And they went to the king in the court and they stood and, and they stored the scroll in the chamber. Elishima, the scribe, and told all the words in the hearing of the king. Verse 23. And it happened when Jehedi had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Down in verse 27. So he, he didn't take kindly to what the Lord was telling him, the instructions that were given to him written down on a, on a scroll, a piece of paper. So he burned it. Burned the word of the Lord. Verse 27, now after the king had burned the scroll with the words, which Barak had written at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, do it again. He says, take yet another scroll and write on it all the former words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. So God's like, yeah, he burned it, write it down again. And you shall say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, you have burned this scroll, saying, why have you written it? And the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause man and beast to cease from him. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one sit on the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out into the heat of the day and the frost of the night. What is he communicating here? He was given clear cut instructions. Tell these people that are sinning to turn from their ways. The person who was in charge says, I don't agree with it. Not only do I not like it, but I don't like it so much that I'm going to burn it. Now, what happened when he didn't follow instructions? His lineage was affected by that. Now, are the consequences as deep for you and I every day to this level? Likely not. But there are other consequences when we don't follow the instruction man. He was instructed with a specific message, a warning. God gave him a warning. Hey, stop what you're doing. Turn around. You're going the wrong way. This is extreme circumstance, but bad things happen when we fail to follow the instruction man. That's just a matter of life. That's just how life works. That's just how it's set up. That's just how God structured it. You have to follow the instruction manual. We talked about the word of God being so powerful that he says all of these physical things that y'all see around y'all each and every day, they'll leave before my word does. The houses y'all live in, the cars y'all drive, the roads y'all go up and down, you know, then I gave you all the intelligence to make those things. You look all the time overseas and you see some, uh, a new building. How tall, the tallest in the world. I think it's in Abu Dhabi or somewhere like that. Dubai. It's like, yo, those things will leave before my word does. And you see the type of material and the solid structure that those things are made out of. And God is saying, my word is more powerful than all of that. That's his instruction manual. 
It's the guide. It's the guide that we have. And I was thinking uh, this last week, and one of the things I always think about is how, like, what makes the what makes Christianity stand out? What makes the Bible different than other books? And so I came across a great article. It says the Bible is unique in authorship. Although the Holy Spirit is ultimately the author, he used many authors to complete the 66 books of the Bible. Around 40 different human writers in a span of, four, of 1,500 years were involved in the collection of scripture. These writers came from different time periods, different backgrounds, different occupations, different geographical locations. The writers included kings, prophets, fishermen, shepherds, servants, priests, and physicians. This broad authorship explains the variety of writing styles. The different authors and the writing styles makes the Bible unique from other religious books, and it's stunning to realize that the entire canon of scripture shares a common theme, God's salvation of mankind, and points to a central character, Jesus Christ. The Bible is unique in content. Numerous religious texts teach good morals and righteous ways of life. Unlike other religious texts advocating good works to please an unreachable God, the Bible uniquely teaches that salvation is a gift that does not require human effort. It goes on to say the Bible is also unique from other religious books and that it contains prophecy. In fact, one count, about 20, 27% of the Bible is predicted. That means that when written over every one out of four verses is, is or was prophetic. Hundreds of Bible details have come true in literal fashion. No other religious book contains prophecy to this extent. The Bible is unique in the language of writing. Most books are written in one language. For instance, the Quran of Islam was written completely in Arabic. Hinduism's Vedas were completely entirely in Sanskrit and the Book of Mormon was written entirely in English. In contrast, the Bible's authors used three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The Bible is unique in its compilation. The Old Testament scriptures were written as the prophets of God received God's word, like we just said a second ago in Jeremiah. The New Testament scriptures were written by eyewitnesses to the events soon after they took place, like the resurrection of God. It says the manuscript evidence for the New Testament is overwhelming. There are at least 5,300 Greek, 10,000 Latin, and 9,000 miscellaneous copies of the New Testament that exist today. This is in stark contrast to any other ancient work, such as something like Aristotle's Poetic, which only has five manuscripts. So people believe books that nowhere near compare to the validity of what the Bible says. Besides, the Bible is also unique in its results. God uses the word to bring about the results of his choosing. One of those results is changing lives. Countless people give testimony around the world about freedom from substance abuse, destructive lifestyles, lying, stealing, habitual anger due to biblical principles and their faith in Jesus Christ. Unique among all religious texts, the Bible stands alone in presenting Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, as the way to salvation. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me. It reminds me of what he says in the first chapter of John. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. The word was with God. He is the one that reveals our creator. That's his instruction manual. And lastly, we look at hope. Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Often referred to as what? What do they, what do they usually call 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Resurrection chapter. Resurrection chapter. Resurrection chapter. <laughs> <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now let's start in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in verse 12, it says, Now if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's like, our whole message is that he came back from the dead. How's that gonna say that people don't come back from the dead? That's the whole message. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. He's like, if, if Jesus didn't do it, then nobody did. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. 
and your faith is also empty. What is he saying? He's like, everything that we believe, all of the hope that we have is based on this one singular event, the resurrection of Christ. Yes, there are tons of other truths inside of the faith, but it all boils down to this. This is the thing that gives us hope, the fact that he came back from the dead. And usually when I hear other people speak of different faiths, you know, I respect it. But I, I can't help but think, again, like we just read, how different is it? Anybody can claim to come back from the dead. Anybody can claim to be God. But it takes a lot more to prove. And so Christ was like, man, this generation that y'all asked for, the wicked generation, y'all asked for all these signs, I'm going to give you a sign. Just like Jonah was inside of the, the great fish for three days and three, three nights, the same way I'm going to be inside the belly of the tomb. What is he saying? He's like, the sign, only sign I'm going to give you, besides all of these miracles that I've been working, is the fact that I came back from the dead. I'm telling you ahead of time, I'm coming back from the dead, and then I'm going to do it. He declared from the very beginning, hey, this is why I'm here. This is why I wrapped myself in human flesh and came down here. It's hope. We see that you don't have to turn there, but John chapter three, verse 16 says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We see in the first, uh, first book of the Bible in Genesis, after Adam and Eve had sinned, God came up with a plan to save mankind. So I did this from... From the foundations of the world, I knew this is what I was going to have to do to save you all. All of that wrapped up into one word is hope. And so, brethren, the purpose of this series is to, to, uh, to hear, as the Christian walk goes, well done, thy good and faithful servant. At the end of our walk, this, this, this Christian walk that we have, right? As, as, as Paul and we're getting, there's a, certain, uh, there's a certain urgency people move with when they know it's getting closer to the end. You see um, certain, any you know, political figure, dominant figures, um, civil rights activists, when they knew something was about to happen to them, or when they knew, hey, I've been doing this for a really long time, this ain't gonna go on forever, their message sounds a little different. And so even when Paul was writing, he's like, I, 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 did, I did the race. I, I ran my race. I did my job. Regardless of what, how many mistakes I made, my past life, I did such and such, such and such. I consider myself the worst of them. But I did my job. So the purpose of this, of this series, brethren, is to encourage our everyday Christian walk. Again, these aren't, this is not an exhaustive list, but I thought these were seven points to help us realize how relevant the Christian walk is in our everyday life. We understand, we have a proper understanding of, of the fear of the Lord. And we don't really, that one kind of seems elementary, but it's a lot of people who look over that. People who don't respect God, they feel like, oh, well, I'm in charge. Like, you are in charge because he's letting you be in charge. He can take the breath out of your body like that. Loving God, loving people. We can't love people properly. Regardless of the differences that they have, we still love. Love is a universal language. We're born knowing. Put a baby next to another baby and see if they don't display love. They can't even speak a word yet, but they speak that language of love. Holy Spirit, we need the Holy Spirit on this walk to do and accomplish amazing feats, to do what we can't do in our own power. And he says that through Zechariah chapter four, he's like, don't even try to do that on your own. Time, we wanna have an understanding of what time it is. Bosses want their clients and those who work under them, please know what time it is. Intimacy. God knows the smallest piece of our create of his creation. He knows the details. How much more the pinnacle of his creation. 
God's instruction manual. We shouldn't ignore it. Don't ignore it. How the king did, how the word of the Lord came to me and ignored it. And the hope that we have. And the one thing because of the one single event, hey, God, he did what he said he was gonna do. He was who he claimed he was. And that's the one and only begotten son. So remember that the walk is relevant to all people in all seasons and in all places. God bless. God bless. Thank you.